everybody. This is our last session of the year for Psychosocial Wednesdays. We will start next uh, year in January. And for that, I just hand over to our uh, birthday boy, Paul, who will uh, read to you the list of uh, hosts we will have next year. Paul? Hi. We have... Uh... We're very pleased to say that we've uh, we've invited a lot of wonderful people and have a complete list for next year. We don't have the titles yet. We'll be doing that in a little while, but we will publish a list um, in the next couple of weeks. In January, we're going to see Fanny Brewster. In February, Luigi Zoya. In March, we're going to see two people, Mauro Magatti and Chiara Giacardi. And then in April, we'll see Marion Dunley. May is Renos Papadopoulos. Pardon me. My mother's Greek. I should get that right. Renos Papadopoulos. Paul Bishop is in June. Kevin Liu in July. Then in September, we'll see George Hoganson, Ursula Brosh in October, our own Stefano Carpani in November, and <coughs> Roderick Main in December. We're also going to have a couple of book launches, including uh, Giovanni Colacchici and Renee Cunningham, and we'll see how those things develop. So thank you. Back to you, Bernhardt. Okay, thanks. Uh, last month we had uh, as our guest Joe Cambre. He talked about uh, complexity or the, the connection between complexity theory and uh, uh, and archetypes and synchronicity. Today we have uh, a, another speaker on a, let's say, a similar uh, topic. This is Nancy Krieger. Uh, Nancy, as she puts it herself, started out in life a long time ago. I'm not quite sure what she's talking about. <laughs> Studying physics <clears throat> because she wanted to know how the work functions. Uh, she spent most of her professional life working in computing and telecom, which fascinated her because it was a constant learning experience of new technology and new areas of application. In the mid-90s, Nancy decided to move out from behind the computer screen, and uh, she wanted to learn more about how people functioned, not the world, but the people. She started training at the Jung Institute in Küsnacht and was one of the first to graduate, uh, to graduate at Eisen. Uh, following this, she, made her, uh, she achieved her PhD in the, at the University of Essex. Uh, in addition to a private practice, she has been the head of the program committee at Eisen. And a couple of years ago, I think uh, 2015 or 14, she was the author of the book uh, Bridges to Consciousness, Complex Complexes and Complexity. Uh, this will her uh, topic more or less uh, today. So I give over to you, Nancy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I want to talk about complexes because I always support the loser, the underdog, the one that gets forgotten. And in Jungian, Jungian circles, it's the archetype that takes center stage and the lowly complex gets pushed aside. Probably because we've all had a bad experience with complexes and we want to forget them. But complexes are where Jung started back in 1900 to about 1910, 1912 at the Bear Boltzley. A number of researchers were working at, on complexes, Wund and Zien in Germany, Adler also in Zurich, Pierre Janet in Paris with Lazy Day Fix, probably because as you've undoubtedly noticed, when the autonomous complex constellates, you can't ignore it, although you may try to. It links the mind definitely with the body. 
which is one reason it interests me. Some 15 years ago, I was interested in studying consciousness, and it seemed like a good place to start was complexes. Since complexes take consciousness away from the ego. Now, consciousness studies is a huge topic. There are many ways of looking at consciousness and all add something to our understanding. I chose to investigate it as an emergent phenomena from a complex dynamic system, our brain and body. Many people confuse consciousness with attention. Now, attention is part of it, but not all. We can direct our attention on something. We cannot choose to be conscious. We are also aware that we are aware of something. Now, we think this second order consciousness is characteristic of humans and implies a second very important, important concept, me, myself. The subject, I am aware, but I'm also object. I am aware that someone, me, is aware. And I'll come back to attention later. I think most of you know how Jung defined the complex. A central emotion, now remember the feeling toned complex. Emotion, this emotion is then like a glue, holding together memories the person has of being in a similar situation before. Now we know that emotion does have a lot to do with how memories are actually stored in the brain. So the complex is actually, uh, the complex is actually emotion and memory, which constellate repeatedly. One of Jung's definition of archetypes is related to instinct. Now the emotion of the complex comes from this archetypal core of instinct. Next, I want to look at the constellation of a complex. What does that actually mean? What is happening in the body and consequently in the psyche when this happens? I'll look at the first seconds or rather the first thousands of a second to the final constellation of the autonomous complex. A number of years ago, a new area of research and thought in mathematics and science studied the emergence in which behavior of a system spontaneously settled into a new state having properties different from their components. This is called dynamic systems theory. And I want to go through quickly the steps of how consciousness then emerges in the dynamic system of the brain and body during the constellation of the autonomous complex. Now this starts with perception. The constellation of a complex is most often triggered by something perceived. You see, hear, feel, smell, something which you react to strongly. The coordination of different sense perceptions is very, very fast. Linking sight, hearing, touch to form a global sensation of what is happening. This may activate a strong emotional reaction. A fight or flight reaction gets us to move quickly if need be. The sympathetic nervous system, the right side of the brain, principally the right amygdala, secretes hormones, mainly adrenaline and cortisol, which increase heart rate, 
pumping blood flow to major muscles, giving the body a sudden burst of energy. As we'll see in the next steps, once this is all related to a sense of self, feelings of wounded self-esteem may come in, which will feed back on the original emotion, exaggerating it. I propose that these interactions, perception, instinct, and emotion, form an emergent state. This starts, as we saw, with the triggering perception, the instinctive reaction to this, and the related emotions arising from it. This reaction is happening on a time scale of a couple of hundred milliseconds, one thousandth to one tenth of a second. It is unconscious and principally involves subcortical areas of the brain, the limbic system, and the brain cell. It's the first level of coordination between different areas of the brain. This first state then sets off changes in the body, preparing it for fight or flight, which is reflected in the energy level and which in turn affects the level of awareness of what is taking place. Memories of similar situations are stimulated. Changes in the energy level and awareness are the result of changes in the body and are very fast. Although the awareness of these changes will take to the order of hundreds of milliseconds. Actually, all systems in the body increase. Blood flow to the muscles, sense perception increases, Breathing increases, blood flow to the brain, everything except digestion that stops. Not necessary at the moment. All of these are controlled by the vagus nerve so that the reaction is very fast. We know that one way memories are linked together is by emotion. The strong emotion and visual image are what is of what is happening starts the recall of similar situations the person has experienced. Actual memory retrieval involving the neocortex and no longer the limbic system and brainstem is relatively slow. It takes about 400 to 500 milliseconds, about half a second, to actually remember something. And I'm proposing that even starting to remember these past events could feed back on other functions in state two, but also even back to state one and influence the perception and affect the nature and intensity of the emotion. I mean, you may realize, oh, I, that's not what I thought I saw at all. And it can all stop. But this brings us to the question of awareness mentioned earlier. Now, a lot of research in neuroscience has investigated this process using neuroimaging techniques to map brain functioning. A lot of this has been brought together under the title of the Global Neuronal Workspace. Based originally on the work of a philosopher, Bernard Bars, Worked, whose work he called the, the global workspace, and then added to this the work of neuroscientists Stanislas Stehany and Jean-Pierre Schoener, who, in addition to their own extensive research, have put together and reviewed the work of numerous researchers, testing in part the point at which someone becomes aware of seeing, say, a letter, a letter which is flashed on a screen, and the various regions of the brain activated to get to this point. It's only once a large area of the brain is working together, the global neuronal workspace, that you become conscious. 
And I'm arguing that this begins happening with the constellation of the complex once the state of awareness is reached. Coordinating perception, the limbic system, emotion, what we saw in stage one, the body through the hormonal system and the brainstem, and now adding the neocortex with memory retrieval to the end of stage two. But this first and second level are biology. The third level of the emergence of the complex brings in the Jungian concepts of meaning, what this all means to me, the ego. We begin talking about psychology. Based on Jung's work on the symbol and his linking of the primordial or original image with instinct to form the archetype, I argue that an image is then what carries the complex into consciousness. But it most often takes words to actually pin it down. Now, central to this stage is the concept of me. Now, me is a very difficult concept, both psychologically and physically. Physically, it's related to what's called the cortical midline structures on the very inside of the neocortex next to the limbic area, thus closely related to emotion. Psychologically, there have been many definitions of me, myself, ego. Jung postulated that the ego forms at about the age of four or five, which is actually quite late. Modern psychologists, including attachment theorists, who have done much work with newborn babies, have postulated that the sense of me comes from a differentiation of contact with an other, a caregiver. This relationship starts, can start even before birth and takes place in a cultural setting. Now, emotions help you to order what you're experiencing they give value. Some things feel good, hence they're positive. Some feel bad, hence they're negative. The baby experiences the image of that that makes it feels, feel good, usually the mother or caregiver, in different contexts. So it begins to stand for, be related to different memories of what happens when it sees that face. One time is food, one time is being held and falling asleep, one time scolding. And if Melanie Klein suggested there's a good object and a bad object, still each one has multiple images. The good face stands for different, several different things, food, sleep, lullaby, and the bad, likewise. It becomes our first symbol, not a sign, which in Jung's terms had a one-to-one -one connection, but a real symbol with multiple meanings, even more than can be expressed. And therefore implying large areas of the neocortex, uh, hence the global neuronal working space. So the infant begins to build up autobiographical memories, and these memories take place in a cultural setting. With language, we learn to put another symbol, a sound this time, to that image, engulfing all of the various meanings. This creation of an image or symbolic image is the result of the combination of past experience, emotions, the implications of what the situation has on my future life. This is in the third level 
of the hierarchy of emergent dynamical systems and locks the entire system into consciousness. This final step is crucial for the establishment of consciousness. In technical terms, it is the order parameter which synchronizes the lower levels of the hierarchy and guarantees emergence. Relating this to the constellation of the complex, the memories coming into consciousness, forming a sort of image, solidifies a feeling of self. I am in danger. I must react. An awareness that I am in relation to something outside me. There is a me and a them. And the me of everyday experience, the ego, is shoved aside. This new restricted me and the emotion of the linking of the past memory creates the meaning and consequently consciousness. At stages one and two of the hierarchy of dynamic systems, there is no consciousness. Only with the integration of self, myself, and what this all means to me, do I become conscious. This realization locks the complex into consciousness. Both body and mind are ready for fight or flight. The last stage takes seconds to manifest, and it may be several more before you regain your composure and come back to normal. Now, what does all this have to do with the word association experiment, which was the other part of my talk? Perception, stage one, is hearing the stimulus word. This may bring back memories of past experiences, increasing the emotion. This takes awareness away from the present moment but the requirement to respond adds pressure to encapsulate this in a response word, a symbol, one having some meaning in the person's life. This all takes time, and the more emotion involved, the more time it will take. The emotion also generates energy, which may result in movement, laughter, a need to react quickly, Hence, asking a question, maybe, or repeating the stimulus word as a question. You say, pride, they reply, pride. Many of the words can be interpreted in different ways, such as stalk, the stalk of a plant, or to hunt a prey, or beat the red vegetable or to beat someone. This is done on purpose, and it's interesting to see how the person interpreted it. The word list is gone through a second time to see if the person remembered what they responded the first time, or if they had the same, the same word comes to mind. The emotion involved in the constellation of the complex may affect working memory. Or if, say, if there is a choice involved that they want to select the right response word, this may get forgotten. The person is told they will be timed. They are not told about these other indicators of a complex, the movement, the repetition, and so forth. Some people respond with the same word several times, either as a response or as a repeat. These are called stereotypes. And it's interesting to look at these words. In addition to the possible complex words, they're like a shield protecting the person from experiencing the emotion caused by the stimulus word. They don't have to think about the word. They can just respond with one of these stereotypes. 
there are a number of evasive ta tactics, unconscious, of course, in the choice of response words. <clears throat> Sometimes people respond with opposites. High, they say low. Black, you say white. Okay. Now, some, a certain number is normal, but if they do it a lot, then it becomes a form of, the, of a shield. Okay. We've also seen some people complete the word. You say hi, they say hi chair. You say door, you say doorknob. Okay. Misunderstanding the word is also, is, and also responding to a different word is also a tactic. All are normal responses, but if they're used too much, they need to be considered as complex indicators. Now, in addition to complex indicators, we also look at response type, if the responses are factual, like chair, table. Most responses in our extroverted world are factual. But the response may also be subjective, relating to the history of the subject. You say chair and they say leather. But this is actually one of mine because the dentist we went to when I was a little child had a sort of leather bench and I have hated leather chairs all of my life. It took me a long time until I remembered why. Okay, the response may also be a value judgment. They say often say things like good, bad, ugly, pretty. This then a response type, along with the um, the the, res the time, the response time, and how the person related to the word association gives us insight into the ego complex and how flexible it may be and how aware the person is of their complexes. All complexes are not negative. There are positive complexes. So growing up, these are often around grandparents. Okay. And it's important to identify these and note them. They can be called in during the analysis when, they need, when the, the client needs some positive feedback or ego strengthening. You know, you're pretty good at this or that, or you, know, you like music, or you're very creative, right? Uh, I've looked at some results from the word association our students have reported. Now, what I'm about to say has absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever. Okay. Please do not say, Krieger said this is scientifically proven. Not at all, okay? The experiments did not take place in a controlled environment, but are part of an analysis with ISAP diploma candidates. We know what we tell the students to tell their analyzons. We don't know what they actually said. The word association is also part of the analytic process. Therefore, there's transference issues which need to be considered. But I was still curious to look at the results, about 50 word association reports that we have. Now I say we, because I always do this together with another analyst, okay? And I always ask permission of the students if I can use their data one day anonymously. I say, you know, when I'm 85 and have nothing to do, and I'm not yet 85 and I do have other things to do, but I was curious to look at them anyway. A different analyst uh, was teaching this before we started and I don't have their data. So I only have about 50. Okay. Uh, it's not surprising that the words which most often elicited complex indicators are those associated with negative emotions. Okay. Despise, which is by far the most often cited. Okay. Despise, pride, stalk, dead, 
pity, afraid, pray, and luck. Now, about a quarter of these are the results from Asian students working with Asian analysts, Chinese and, Jap uh, Chinese and Japanese. The results were a bit different. Despise is still first, but pride was out and carry and pray came to the top of the list. Uh, I have purposely not made a slide of these results, okay? There is really too little data to, to do anything at all scientific about this. Yeah. I have had recently contact with a router group in China, which has also been doing the word association. They said their data shows a correlation with, and I quote them, Confucian collective norms. Now, this is all very recent, and I have not seen this data. Okay. It would certainly be interesting if we could establish some cooperation with router programs and developing groups to see if the results correlate with expected cultural norms or cultural complexes. Now, looking at the complexes cited in our students' reports, is even more questionable than looking at the words, which may have resulted in the constellation of a complex. We encourage students not to stick with the traditional naming of mother, father, since this always leads to confusion with the relationship with the actual mother and father, but some still do. Top rating of complexes, is relationship, how I interpret mother complex, another word for it, okay. This seems to be a problem more in the West than is shown in reports from Asians, okay. Uh, this may be related to another problem, a complex cited in the reports by several students of not feeling related to their original family. There's some kind of problem with relationship, okay? Aggression, power, powerlessness appears to be a problem with most women. Low self-esteem is a universal problem with all subjects, taking the word association. But it may be related to why they are in analysis in the first place. Now remember, all of this data is from our students working with their analyzons. And so it's not necessarily representative of a general public. And many gain strength and feel positive about their intellectual ability and creativity. This, as I've mentioned, can be referred to during the analysis when you as analysts need to strengthen the ego. So why do we teach the word association if it's not to get the scientific results? For one thing, the candidate learns to look at the client. The feedback from the students, the first time that, that they tried giving the word association to another in our introductory seminar is how hard it really is to see and note all that is happening. So it's a good way to learn to look at your client. And then once we go through the stimulus words and note the responses, we go back and ask the client about the memories around these words. What story is behind each? This gives us lots of stories. These stories overlap with the dreams they tell in analysis. It gives the client insight into who they are to get to the point of actually writing the report, the student has to deal deeply with the stories and the unconscious of the analyzant. Many say they'll use it again. I don't know if they actually do. Thank you.
Thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Before I open the floor, that is the please put your questions into the chat box. Uh, I will have uh, I've one or two questions myself, if I may. <laughs> um, one question just to uh, put it in the right perspective. When you talk of emergence, then you are talking about the emergence put forward by the English philosophers Broad, Alexander and Morgan. Um, I, I worked a lot um, with the work of, um, of actually a German physicist called Henken, who did a lot of work on, he was the man who explained to the world why lasers emit light, which is, is one of the, the first um, physical uh, applications, for applications of, of, of emergence is that you have this stone or gem, a ruby, and you put electricity in it, and suddenly something completely different happens, yeah. a light emerges. And, okay. and so, it, and his, this was then his, also his term of the order parameter mm -hmm. that locks the system into, uh, into an emergent state. So it was his work really that I used. Yeah, uh, immersion is quite popular with physicists. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, then another short question from my side is, uh, in your last slide, uh, you bring together the symbolic image, the me and the meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I hear meaning, then always I think of synchronicity. Is this is where synchronicity comes in uh, through a complex, or a complex may, may direct us, or a synchronistic phenomena may direct us to, the, to a complex? It could. I mean, I have synchronicity is, is someplace where I want to go. I really haven't looked at it uh, in terms of the, the complex. The meaning um, that I had is at, at this level is something, you know, very, very basic. Like, I got to get out of here. <laughs> or, this is a really bad situation. <laughs> Um, it's, it's that, you know, it's no, it's no big, beautiful philosophical meaning. It's, you know, I'm in trouble and, you know, my life is going to stop right here if I don't get out or I'm going to get fired if, you know, it's that, that basic idea of meaning, putting it in the context of what's happening in the context of my life. So it's not a meaning with a capital M as... It's, it's a real gut, yeah. you know. Yeah. Okay. What does it mean for me, you know, yeah. tomorrow, this afternoon, right? Okay, so I come back, I know I go back to the audience now, and we have the first question from Leslie Garner, Gardner, uh, who has a slightly different uh, standing as you at, at uh, uh, I think. She's, she asks, I know that eventually Jung found his word association test inadequate. It always seemed that way to me. What did it all amount to? Interpretation is the indispensable and subjective. I was going to say flawed. What is your, your thought on that, Nancy? Well, I think, I mean, I, I can go back to this. You know, it's not a scientific study. It is a training tool. Okay? I think it's a good example uh, for students to see complexes, to understand complexes. Okay? Uh, but as a scientific, uh, you know, I would agree with Jung. It's not, um, it's not a scientifically valid um, tool. Yeah, yeah but that, what, what is it good for then? Well, I mean, it's good. It's good for 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 the tr training of of the analyst, and I think it's also good for the person to to realize. That it, I mean, it makes it's it's a when you get caught, someone's giving you these words, and suddenly you're caught, and you can't think of anything. You realize how strongly it 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 gives you a point where you I really have to look at this. You know what's happening here. 
Um, so the, it makes so it the, very real, th this idea of complex. So uh, the, the, body, was, the bodily reaction to that would yeah. uh, will, will, yeah. Uh, yeah. point you in that direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question from Paul. Um, he asked, uh, I realized you haven't gotten it. No, he asked, what would you hope to find around synchronicity? Oh, in, no. in, your, in your outlook, you said, uh, I want to go into that direction of synchronicity. Yeah. What, well, what are you yeah. I, 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 want to, I want to look at, at it's synchronicity, a lot of synchronicity seems, I mean, at least in, in my practice, the rest of my life is quite normal. But around my practice, there's, there seems to be a lot of synchronicities happen, you know, strange things, you know. And, and, and I don't, and so that started me off. I've asked some other analysts and, and some people have said, yes, of course. No. Other people say no. And so I'm trying to look at the analytic field and, and what can be going on between the analyst and the analyzant at perhaps a level of meaning in, in, in like a fourth dimension in, 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 you know, that's, that zaps down, that, that emerges into our consciousness as, as, as a synchronistic event. Okay. That there, I mean, there might be a lot of things, you're beginning to think I'm a little bit clogged on, but, but there's, there's, you know, if we didn't know about electricity or magnetism, I mean, you'd look at this and say, this is magic, you know? And now we understand these things and it's perfectly normal. And there may be other things we don't understand yet that are really out there part of the real world. We just don't know them. <clears throat> and they are manifesting and emerging into our world as synchronicities. And that's what I'd want to look at too. How, so if anybody is analysts, if all I'm interested in all of your stories about synchronicities that happening around your practice, please send me all those stories <laughs> that you can. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, there is a question from uh, Margaret Stienstra. Uh, I would appreciate hearing a bit more from Nancy about the emergence of a cultural complex. In an individual, a personal complex reaches some degree of awareness from its emotional tension and often reactions of others. What of a cultural complex closer to, to the collective? Mm -hmm. An individual may recognize but project the cultural complex uh, as a quick way to unload its personal implications, but it, may but it may take time for a community or society to recognize a cultural complex as a shared phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's started off um, to be, you know, work done now on cultural complexes, but people within a cultural setting, you know, inheriting those complexes <clears throat> um, from your culture, okay? which would be interesting in the, in the work if we can do with, um, as I said, with Asian groups or, or any developing groups, uh, if they find that people are, what types of, complexes people have if they're related to cultural norms. M more recent work that I also find interesting is uh, work that's, that um, Samuel Kimball's has um, spoken about in his, um, in his latest book, um, Phantom Narratives where he talks about not only a culture can have complexes, but any group can have complexes. Uh, and I think this would explain, could explain, um, you know, even like in, a, in an employment situation, people that are being mobbed, 
you know, as an example of a group complex, right? Uh, that that a group can take on uh, and and act practically unknowingly because they're acting out a group complex. Um, and I think we could we could do a lot of work on on in in this area relating complexes to not only cultures but to any group setting uh, school children being being uh, excluded uh, sometimes and you know that are, we could help bring light into these areas too okay there's another one from Lavinia uh, Tanculescu. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Uh, uh, she points to the fight or flight uh, impulse, or uh, is it an impulse? Yes. No. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and she asked uh, if we could add the as a, as a third response freeze. Yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah. And Maybe, this, would, yeah. this would be the same type of the kind other kind of instinctive reaction. Yes, yeah. fight, flight, freeze. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> which, which, incidentally, they've. Uh, I, I remember Mario Jacobi talked a lot about shame, and I think he related it to this, uh, this freeze reaction. You know, feelings of emotion of shame being. Same idea. If I don't move, nobody will see me. Mm. Mm. Uh, your talk uh, seemed to be quite dense, so we don't have any more questions. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> All right now. Um, and no, there's another one from Margaret Stienstra. Uh, How do those, she's coming back to the cultural complexes, obviously. How do the, these cultural complexes emerge physiologically with reverence to the diagrams shown? What might be happening in and among people? Well, then I, there would have to be, I mean, we'd have to get to another level of relating level three to other level threes and communicating uh, between them. If they're relating in the same, in the, you know, with the same background, mm. when they talk about, they can say that the culture kind of has a complex, or that the people in the culture have a complex. The the work from Thomas Singer. Um, Lenny Cunningham has one. Uh, <clears throat> what role does mirror neurons play in this process? Um, Popular question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think mirror neurons, well, because they've, they've looked at mirror neurons a lot having to do with, with empathy. Uh, and this would get into the communication of, of, of the feeling. Perhaps somebody seeing someone react with a complex will then also have that share that reaction okay, and empathize with with the person. I have my doubts with uh, mirror neurons. <laughs> okay, uh, another question from Evia Volva Westergaard. I hope that's right. Uh, coming back to the cultural complexes seems to be a big topic. Neurobiolog neurobiologist uh, Robert Zapolsky wrote in his book Behave that we recognize a face of another person based on its colors, color similar similarity to our own in a few milliseconds or a few, it's 250. Mm -hmm. uh, a racial complex has a real physiological, has a real physiological basis. It seems that the body does not get enough attention when we consider a union approach. Well, I, that, that was one of the, well, it's coming up. <laughs> you know, you're having uh, Marion Dudley, uh, I heard is coming and whatnot. I mean, 
was one thing that interested me is is also is that it's the it's it's the brain which is in the body you know so it's it's really um, it's not something separate or spirit coming coming flow down you know causing um, consciousness it's uh, as they seem to think in the middle ages but coming up from the body and I've lost track of what the question was. Uh, the the no. ratio, has the racial complex a real physiological basis? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if, I would think if you look at people, a small child looking at people, well, the, the child doesn't know what it looks like. You know, it have to. Um, the small child doesn't doesn't see. It's what you you get used to. I mean, I, I when I was at university and back in University of Michigan a long time ago, uh, I lived in an international center, um, and there were you you after a while you didn't see if people were black or white or. Oriental, or you didn't, you just didn't see it. And someone, in fact, asked me, you know, how many black women are in this, you know, living in, in the center? And I just thought about it and I missed one. You know, I couldn't even, you don't, after a while, you, you just see the people, they're people, and they're no longer black, white, or Chinese, or whatever. Doesn't matter. So, it, I think it would be a lot of experience if the small child has experienced other racial people. I don't think they would see them uh, anymore as being strange. They're just different color. Doesn't matter. Uh, it's uh, the question if it's, it's it's if it's really physiological. It's I would think it's ideological. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a question from Rachel Steele. How does PTSD relate to the complex? Oh, PTSD, I think, is something different. I mean, PTSD is that the memory is, 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 is blocked. You know, mm. it's just a separate thing. You're, you're, it's no longer a memory that you can work with as you could work with a complex. Um, it's... PTSD and I think that uh, is is uh, it's, it's, it's outside of the area of complexes, something else. Okay. <clears throat> so there are no more questions then, then maybe we close our session five minutes early. Um, I wish, I thank you very much. I thank, thank everybody for joining that us. And uh, certainly, I'm looking forward to your uh, research and synchronicity. That's my hobby. <laughs> and uh, hobby is not the right word. Um, and everybody else, have a good Christmas and a good year. And we see each other in January. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. okay. Ciao. Thank you, everyone. Have a good holiday. Thank you. You too. Yeah.